Hello and welcome to this lecture on employee rights and discipline. Managers often have to discipline employees for a variety of reasons and it's usually a very uncomfortable situation for both the manager and the employee. In this lecture I will discuss some employee rights that should not be violated and give some advice on engaging in proper and effective discipline. Let's get started. Employee rights are guarantees of free treatment that employees expect from their employer in exchange for their effort and service. Expectations between the employee and the employer about the employment relationship are referred to as the psychological contract. Such expectations become rights when granted to employees by the courts, legislatures, or employers. Examples of employee protection rights include the right to privacy, and the right to protest unfair disciplinary actions. The concept known as employment at will pertains to the typical employment situation where the duration of employment is open-ended or indefinite. Employment at will is the right of an employer to fire an employee at any time for any reason or without giving a reason at all. At the same time, the employee has the right to quit at any time. The employment relationship is thus at the will of both parties. This right was affirmed in the 1908 court case Adair v. United States. Adair v. United States. However, employers do not have unrestricted rights to terminate employees. For example, an employer cannot terminate employees based on protected class characteristics such as, but not limited to, gender, race, or disability status. And collective bargaining agreements between employers and unions may place restrictions on termination. In general, most employers are cautious to terminate employees without good cause because courts are increasingly sided with terminated employees who feel that they have been unjustly fired, even if these employees are told that they are employed under the Employment at Will Doctrine. A termination of an employee that is illegal is called wrongful discharge. Wrongful discharge lawsuits are brought by employees who believe they were terminated unfairly or wrongfully. Such suits challenge the employer's rights to terminate an employee under the employment at will concept. There are three exceptions to an employment at will situation where wrongful discharge may actually be established. The first exception is any violation of public policy. For example, an employee may not be legally terminated for refusing to commit a crime, such as perjury on the employer's behalf, for whistleblowing, or for reporting the employer's illegal conduct, or for exercising employment rights. Such employee acts are protected by various laws in place. The second exception is violation of an implied contract. Wrongful discharge occurs when an employer terminates an employee in a manner contrary to any oral or written promise that is considered a condition of employment. These promises may relate to job security or to termination procedures. To avoid establishing any type of implied contract, employers can do many things. For example, it's best for employers to publish employment at will statements and to get employees to sign statements of understanding acknowledging the presence of these policies. Employers should also document and follow an established termination policy with a clear series of steps warnings, and performance improvement opportunities. This will encourage the consistent treatment of employees as well as the documentation of employee performance problems. The third exception is violation of an implied covenant. Under contract law, a general assumption is that people will act in good faith and deal fairly without breaking their word. An employer violates an implied covenant when it breaks its word, so to speak. For example, an employer may have implied to an employee that he will have continued employment as long as he has satisfactory job performance. If the employee is then terminated at will, meaning for no good reason, then an implied covenant has been broken. Another example is when a company changes the rules of a contest just before the contest ends so that an employee has no way to avoid being terminated. 
Here's a fictitious example. Suppose a company has a sales contest that states that anyone who fails to meet their sales quota this period will be fired and quotas are set to be 110% of last year's sales. As time goes by, it appears everyone will meet the new quota. So the company decides to raise the quota on the day before the period expiration. If an employee has sales of, say, 115% of last year's sales, but the new quota is set to 120%, then that employee gets fired because of the rules of the game changed at the very last minute before the employee had a chance to meet it. That's a violation of an implied covenant. Constructive discharge occurs when an employer makes employment conditions so intolerable for an individual that the employee feels forced to voluntarily quit or resign. The employer may do this rather than simply terminating the employee in order to avoid paying severance or unemployment benefits, for example. When suing for constructive discharge, the employee must usually first establish that he or she gave the employer written notice that conditions were intolerable and that the conditions then continued. Under the Workers Adjustment Retraining and Notification or WARN Act of 1989, organizations are required to provide a business closing notification. An organization with more than 100 employees must give 60 days notice of any closure or layoff affecting 50 or more full-time employees. Exceptions to this advanced notification exist for unforeseeable circumstances and faltering businesses. Let's move on. Employee privacy is a significant workplace issue today. Courts and laws generally try to strike a balance between employee expectations of privacy at the workplace against the employer's right to monitor employee work activity. Here are some of the most important current issues in employee privacy. Companies in the United States can legally test employees for drugs. The EEOC only allows drug testing of job applicants after they have received conditional offers of employment. And remember that recovering drug addicts are protected from discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but only if they remain drug free. Being in recovery from drug addiction does not give one carte blanche to take drugs again. However, there are some protections under the ADA. It's complicated. So if you ever find yourself in that position, always consult an attorney. In general, drug testing is most common in positions that are considered safety sensitive, such as in public transportation or operation of heavy machinery. Organizations should follow careful testing procedures and should keep results confidential. Individual states tend to have their own restrictions for drug testing in the private sector. Some states are more pro-drug testing in that they generally allow testing of employees and job applicants in order to encourage drug-free workplaces. States with more restrictive drug testing laws tend to only allow drug testing in very specific circumstances. You may be wondering how recent laws legalizing marijuana in some states affects workplace drug testing. It is indeed legal to smoke pot in some states. But this does not mean that you can be under the influence and thus fail a drug test. Employers have the right to maintain a drug-free workplace whether or not a substance is legal in their state. This is similar to the issue of alcohol. Alcohol is legal in every state, but organizations are absolutely allowed to require employees to be fit for duty. Some employers may use impairment testing to ensure that employees are free of impairment on the job. Employers may use searches and surveillance in the workplace as long as a legitimate business reason exists to do so. Camera surveillance is permitted as long as the employees are informed of it and as long as privacy is preserved. In other words, no cameras in restrooms or locker rooms. Employers have the legal right to monitor phone calls and text messages if there is a compelling business reason. However, 
In general, the employer is not permitted to listen in on personal conversations. Although the employee can be reprimanded for making personal phone calls if there is a policy in place that prohibits them. Employers may also monitor employees' email, internet, and computer use. Email monitoring is limited to the organization's own email system. Employee internet access can legally be restricted to approved sites. And employers can actually legally search employees' general work areas, desk, work lockers, and so on, even without employees' knowledge. But the employer should have probable cause to conduct searches just to avoid legal issues. As for access to personnel files, the organization should be careful to safeguard information. Employees' personal information must be kept private to avoid potential misuse, such as identity theft. Employees are legally allowed to view information in their personnel files, although the extent of access varies from state to state. Usually, it's a good idea to have someone from HR or management be present when an employee views his or her file to be sure that nothing is altered. Most organizations allow employees to access their files regardless of legal requirements. With the advent of social networking, the employee's conduct outside the workplace has become more observable. Employees, of course, have the right to free speech as guaranteed under the First Amendment. Employees are legally protected when saying negative things about their workplace and their supervisors, for example. In fact, the National Labor Relations Act is being used more and more now to protect employees' remarks about their workplaces because the NLRA grants employees the right to discuss their working conditions. Individual states have their own laws and regulations regarding off-work conduct. In general, employees have the right to engage in off-work activity or to make remarks about their workplace. If an organization feels the need to reprimand or discipline for such activity, it's probably a good idea to seek legal counsel before taking action. Let's move on. Discipline within the context of the organization does not mean punishment. Instead, it is used as a means to correct the behaviors of employees to help them to meet acceptable performance standards. The discipline process is important because employees are very sensitive to the process and because it provides documentation for various employment decisions. Managers do not look forward to disciplining their employees. However, the costs associated with inaction are important. Other employees within a work group become demotivated when a manager fails to address a discipline problem within their work group. Such problems include attendance problems, dishonesty problems, performance problems, and a host of on-the-job problems like sexual harassment, sleeping on the job, gambling, insubordination, etc. Setting organizational rules provides the basis for effective discipline. Good recommendations for setting discipline rules include, first, to publish the rules widely. Second, to review them regularly. Third, to explain their reasons. Fourth, to get signed statements of understanding. Fifth, to be timely with the setting of rules. Sixth, to be reasonable in their setting. And seventh, to keep the rules in writing. The hot stove approach to employee discipline can be a helpful way to conceptualize the process. Employee discipline should be fair, impartial, and consistent. Think of the discipline process as a very hot stove. First, the hot stove gives fair warning that it will burn those who touch it. The hot stove is impartial in that it does not care who touches it, it does not care who touches the stove. Last, it is effective immediately is enforced consistently in that it applies to all employees in an impersonal and unbiased way. Investigation into disciplinary problems is a challenge. Most managers do not enjoy the discipline process, and so investigations may often be done in a haphazard way. This can open the organization up to legal action if an employee feels unfairly treated. During the investigation, all sides of the issue should be examined. 
there are several items that should be documented during the discipline process. Because this documentation can serve as admissible evidence in hearings and lawsuits that might follow. Some of them are date, time, and place of infraction, prior discussions with the employee about the problem, etc. An investigative interview should be conducted to make the employee aware of the offense. In the court case of NLRB versus Weingarten Incorporated, a request for union representation in such an interview must be granted in unionized workplaces. Let's move on. If an investigation shows that an employee should re receive discipline, there are two basic approaches that can be used. Progressive discipline refers to the application of corrective measures by increasing their severity so that the problem is nipped in the bud, so to speak, and only if discipline is invoked as is necessary. Throughout this process, the employee understands why they are being disciplined, and the progressive nature of the process allows the employee to improve performance in order to avoid further discipline. An example of this performance is the of this, I'm sorry, process is the Performance Improvement Plan, or PIP, which sets out performance improvement expectations so that an employee can avoid termination for poor performance by showing improvement during a probationary period. A different approach is that of positive discipline. This involves joint problem solving between the employee and their supervisor. Nothing is imposed on the employee as all solutions are jointly reached. The next slide will portray pictorially the process of positive discipline. Let's move on to it. Following a positive discipline process, positive or non-punitive discipline is utilized. This is a, a system of discipline that focuses on the early correction of employee misconduct, with the employee taking total responsibility for correcting the problem. The first step is the oral reminder or first conference, if you will. The employee and the supervisor meet at this stage to find a solution to the problem. The outcome of this meeting is not typically put into writing unless further misconduct occurs. If it remains unsolved, the procedure moves to the next step. If it is resolved, the managers engage in recognition and reinforcement of the newly appropriate behavior. The next step is a second conference where a written reminder is placed in an employee's file. The meeting is held to determine why the employee did not meet with the solution agreed on in the first conference, and a new or repeated solution is stated at this point. As with oral reminders, if it remains unsolved, the procedure, the procedure moves to the next step. If it is resolved, the managers engage in recognition and reinforcement of the newly appropriate behavior. In the third step, if the desired results are still not reached, the employee is given a paid one-day decision-making leave to decide whether to leave the organization or to return to work with a commitment to improve their performance. The employee takes responsibility through this process for his or her performance improvement. If the employee accepts responsibility, then recognition and reinforcement for the decision is made. Instead, if the employee decides that the commitment cannot occur, then termination ensues. But it is the employee's decision to leave. Let's move on. Employee discharge should be handled with tact and consideration for the employee. Additionally, supervisors should avoid defaming the employee. An employee should be informed of termination by his or her supervisor in an honest and tactful manner. It is best for the supervisor to rehearse comments to be made in a termination meeting to assure that all important information is delivered effectively. In the termination meeting, the supervisor should come to the point quickly. List the reasons for termination logically and clearly. They should be firm and straightforward, and they make sure that the discussion is held in a private and business-like setting. Although it can be tempting for the supervisor to sugarcoat the decision by making statements such as, this was not my idea, or you're a great employee, but 
it is best to avoid sending mixed signals. The discussion should be brief, firm, and to the point. Due process can be defined as an employee's right to be heard or as an employee's right to present his or her position during a disciplinary action. During an employee termination, it is important to provide due process to the terminated employee to communicate that a fair process has been followed. In addition, the important aspects of due process include the employee's right to know, right to consistent treatment, right to fair discipline, right to appeal, and right to progressive discipline. Let's move on. Alternative dispute resolution or ADR methods are often used to help address employee discharges and complaints outside of the court system. This is usually faster and cheaper for both parties rather than pursuing costly legal processes. ADR is typically used in non-unionized settings as an alternative to the grievance procedure spelled out in the collective bargaining agreement in unionized settings. Employees in non-unionized settings are often required to sign ADR agreements, meaning that they are required to go through the ADR process instead of suing their employer in many situations. In order for these agreements to be enforceable, they must be fair and equitable to both the employee and the employer. Here are some of the types of ADR methods commonly used. The step review system is a system for reviewing employee complaints and disputes by successively higher levels of management. There is no neutral third party in this situation. A higher level manager, such as the HR director, president, or CEO, serves as the final authority in reserving the conflict as it goes up the hierarchy. Under a peer review system, there's a review of employee complaints by committee using a group composed of equal numbers of employee representatives and management appointees. It functions as a jury since its members weigh evidence, consider arguments, and after deliberation, vote independently to render a final decision. This can be used in conjunction with a step review system to enhance a sense of fairness. Many organizations utilize what is called an open door policy. This is a policy of settling grievances that identifies various level of management above the immediate supervisor for employee contact. An employee is allowed to, to approach various managers above his or her immediate supervisor with complaints or grievances. In order to be a fair process, employees should first try to resolve issues with their immediate supervisors. An upper level manager should remain fair and open-minded if approached with issues. An ombudsman system is involved in the use of a designated individual from whom employees may seek counsel for the resolution of their complaints. The ombudsman's role is to work cooperatively with both sides of an issue to try and resolve it through settlement and problem solving. The ombudsman advocates for a fair process and compromise between parties within a confidential setting. Mediation involves the use of a neutral third party in resolving a conflict between an employee and a manager. Mediators suggest solutions to issues, but their suggestions are non-binding upon the parties. Mediators serve primarily as fact finders and communication between the parties in a conflict. Arbitration is a process that can save employers huge sums in litigation costs. Some employees may require such arbitration for discrimination suits. Arbitration is typically binding, but it may be non-binding in some very rare situations. To ensure the legality of arbitration, such as an ADR procedure requires, the policy must be clearly communicated and procedurally fair. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.